The ancient Egyptians' knowledge of vibration was extraordinary. They kept it secret from people. Egyptians were recognized for their intelligence and their capacity to put structures and patterns to things. Hence, their hieroglyphs, their pyramids, and other marvelous ancient structures. We'll be looking at the Egyptian knowledge of vibration and how extraordinary it was. We'll also look at why they kept the secret hidden from people. When I want to start the discussion of ancient Egyptian temple science, I usually start with this particular slide. And this slide in particular is from the masterwork by Schwaller de Lubitz, which is called The Temple of Man. This particular one in the book is titled Master of the Net at Karnak. The first thing to be aware of in this book is that this first being in particular was considered to be the initiator of the spiritual culture of Egypt. In most times when the Egyptians would use the heads of animals to represent their gods, it represented a state of consciousness and a type of primordial power. So the point wasn't worshipping the animals or that they worshipped the animals, it was that they actually understood that various aspects of power, which came from the mind of God, actually manifest themselves in different beings and different processes, and that since the mind of God really manifests in these beings, the state of consciousness and power manifest in particular animals. Then these animals have the heads on the body of a human being, but this being, in particular, was not referred to as Fox by the Egyptians. This was a later Greek corruption of the name, but the original name was closer to Jehote or Tahote. And this being in question is shown stretching the cord in hieroglyphics. The stretching of the cord has significance because it's a ritual in ancient Egypt that has to do with the mystery that is central to every great spiritual tradition. A question we tend to ask ourselves is, how are we conscious spiritual beings living in a physical world, in a physical body, and we actually don't even remember who we are or how we got here? This has to do with the process of creation, which is really connected to what we think of today as sacred geometry, and also the process of moving from what in physics of today we call a singularity. And this was always the concept of center in ancient traditions such as the Bindu point in the Himalayan tradition. Then from that, zero-dimensional space, which is the beginning singularity, and also the unified core point. You move out from there into the first dimension of space. So this being in particular is stretching the cord in order to create space and create a container in which conscious beings can also evolve and attain higher states of development. After the first point of dimensional movement, and the second dimensional movement, then finally the third dimensional movement, you must have created a three-dimensional space. Now let's look at what exactly is behind this on the temple walls. This was addressed in the book of De Labitz, and in his book he calls it both Master of Numbers at Karnak. So, this actually shows something that Egyptologists know about, but don't actually understand, and the significance of this is that there is a background net that the master designers in ancient Egypt usually used to lay out the figures on the temple wall. However, it wasn't something that could be simply done that you could just arrange the aspects of the art on the wall. There is a vibrational component to it. So what's actually being represented here in the grid is that one of the primary grids was a 19 level grid, and a particular power has been attributed to the power 19. Most classical traditions understand not only sacred geometry, but also sacred numerology. And this simply means that just as the shape has power, numbers also have powers. The tradition that really understood the power of the number 19 was the ancient Egyptian civilization, and this was part of their 19-level vibrational grid. Then, this particular knowledge passed on to the next spiritual culture that came into that area, and that was Islam. And in today's Islam, 19 is a sacred number. Therefore, the background grid of energy is also represented in a malleable form that can be directly manipulated and applied in the hands of the initiates. So when you see such on the temple walls in Egypt, the pictures of the initiates with the net in their hands, this net actually represents the fabric of space-time. This is the vibrational grid behind every living being and every structure in the phenomenal world. So most times the hieroglyphs that accompany this would often say something like, they are being taught how to catch and cast magic. But this translation is that of an old Egyptian term. 
We need to bear in mind the saying by great science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke, which says that magic is a term that we give for a form of technology that we cannot understand. This is exactly what is happening here because they were being taught how to use vibrational matrices and also vibrational grids which stand behind everything in the physical world. And this also includes the human physical body which is based on a specific vibrational grid. Now, just like how Jehote was shown in the previous illustration from the temples here, we have an interaction between one of these actual great beings and the pharaoh. So today when we actually translate the Egyptian text into English, we translate them in a way that says this is a god or goddess. The Egyptian text also uses the term netter, and this netter is based on the hieroglyphic language that represents phonetics as the letters NTR. Netter actually means a conscious force of nature, and so there's no dichotomy for them between a conscious being and a force of nature. But today we have a tremendous dichotomy, and we also think of nature as a clockwork mechanism that can be manipulated in some external way. However, most of the classical traditions, which also include the ancient Egyptian traditions, understood that the forces of nature are conscious, and that they can be communicated with and are part of the initiation process of learning how to communicate with the forces of nature.